Welcome to the third webinar in a series focusing on welcoming and supporting newly arrived pupils who have been displaced. By the end of last month, the UK had received 27,100 visa holders from Ukraine and more will arrive in weeks to come. In today's webinar, we will focus on Ukrainian children and young people their families and the role of schools and the wider community in welcoming and creating a supportive environment as they settle into a new life in the UK, our education system and the specific school setting. Before I introduce today's speaker, I just wanted to explain very briefly the structure of this webinar, which is very, very simple. First, today's speaker's Lena will speak for about 40 minutes and after that, she will take any questions that you may have. We have already received some questions sent to you in advance. Please uh, feel free to use the Q&A box rather than the chat box, please, to send any questions as they come to you, and I will collect them and post them to Lena after her presentation. Tomorrow, you will receive an email from us with a link to access the video recording of this webinar and also any links that, will, uh, that Lena and uh, everybody will mention throughout the webinar. It gives, me, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Lena Maximuk. Lena is the head teacher of Nottingham Ukrainian School, where she has been teaching since 2016. Having obtained a master's degree in English, she lived and worked in Japan for eight years where she taught English as a foreign language to a wide range of age groups and various educational settings, from private language schools to universities. Lena is the deputy chair of the Nottingham branch of the Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain and is in charge of cultural and community events at the Ukrainian Cultural Center. She has presented at numerous UK-based and international conferences on minority languages and supplementary schools. She is co-author of the award-winning Ukrainian studies project, Hlena, the first history activity book. Lina's professional interests are in teaching Ukrainian as a foreign language, heritage languages, and the use of digital technologies in a supplementary school setting. Before handing over to Lina, I just wanted to highlight how lucky we are that Lina has agreed to join us today. As you can imagine, to say that Lena's extremely busy right now is a woefully inadequate understatement. Lena and her colleagues are working tirelessly to help an ever increasing number of Ukrainian families settle, signposting information for sponsors and families and managing social media groups, which are growing exponentially at the moment. So I wanted to give you special thanks, Lena, on behalf of the Bell Foundation for being with us this afternoon. Over to you, Lena. Hello everyone, good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me today. I will share my presentation now. All right. So in my presentation today, um, I'm going to talk um, briefly about the Ukrainian community in the UK. Um, then um, we'll touch uh, briefly the educational system of Ukraine. Uh, we'll talk about the language situation in Ukraine. And then in the end, um, I'm going to try and um, uh, suggest some ways that uh, these new children, new arrivals can be supported uh, through various ways of uh, parental engagement at schools and community involvement. So. Before we start, before the first section, I wanted to ask you a question right away. <laughs> so obviously couldn't wait until the very end, but would like to hear your voices and your ideas. I'm sure you have seen the map of Ukraine uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, uh, a lot more often uh, than probably by, uh, before uh, the 24th of February. Uh, but um, my question is, um, if you have any ideas what's wrong with this map and as a hint um, uh, this is not about the administrative structure or the territorial integrity of the country uh, this is uh, more about the um, um, 
language. Not sure if I can see the, oh yes, yes, actually some correct answers. Yeah, I can see that. Well done, <laughs> well done, thank you. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the first uh, few things that I would really like to draw your attention to is the correct spelling of some of the words that are of extreme importance uh, these days to every Ukrainian. Um, so um, some of the major cities in Ukraine um, should be spelled uh, according to the way the Ukrainians pronounce these words, not, uh, not, not, not from the Russian language. Uh, so it's not Kiev, it's Kiev. It's not Lvov, it's Lviv. Yeah, you can see the city here in the west. And the major river um, flowing through, through, through the whole country um, and falling into the Black Sea is not Dnieper, but it's Dnipro, or you can use the English version Dnieper. And then the, uh, another very, very important thing, um, the name of the country um, we use without the article there. I feel I just need to, to remind some of you in case um, um, some, some people are sometimes still still forgetting. Um, this is uh, another really, really important, very, very small word, but very important word um, uh, because um, this, this goes to uh, the olden days when uh, Ukraine was still a part of the Soviet Union and uh, this used to be called the Ukrainian Republic. So every time the name of the country is used with the article there, it kind of has this connotation that this is still a part of um, um, a bigger empire or a bigger country, which is not the case anymore. So thank you very much for uh, keeping those in mind and remembering this um, really, really important issues. All right. Um, the Ukrainian community in the UK um, is very old. Uh, the first big major wave came to the United Kingdom just after the Second World War. Um, and these were mainly the labor workers or um, uh, people um, who ended up in the wrong military division. And then for various political reasons, uh, they uh, knew that going back uh, to the Soviet Union would mean um, lifelong persecution. So uh, the, um, there, were, there were a lot of um, displaced persons by the end of the war and many of them found uh, shelter in the uh, United Kingdom. So this is where uh, and when um, a lot of um, branches, um, a lot of uh, cultural centers were established and this is when a lot of Ukrainian schools also came to be. Um, the Ukrainian language school in Nottingham is one of the oldest ones. Um, of course, there used to be a lot more of them um, in, the, in, the, in the olden days, uh, but obviously due to assimilation and other processes, numbers of the Ukrainian community were dwindling uh, throughout the years. And um, up to now, uh, we only have uh, seven Ukrainian schools in the UK. Um, there's, uh, of course, a lot uh, more smallish clubs and groups or um, uh, little organizations focusing on more cultural activities but the places that are offering um, a proper educational service is, is these um, seven schools, and I'm going to name them. So the biggest one is today, obviously, in London. Then we also have one in Luton, uh, Reading, Coventry, Nottingham, Bradford, um, and Manchester. So hopefully, um, we will see more schools coming up to uh, existence in the near future. <clears throat> what our school is about, obviously, this is a Saturday school, so that means it is a supplementary school, it is not a mainstream school. Uh, there is no mainstream school um, for Ukrainians uh, in the UK, uh, there never was. Um, so as a supplementary school, of course, we cannot compete with any sort of national curriculum. Um, and um, rather than that, um, we position ourselves as a place of um, Ukrainian identity, where children who come to us every Saturday can learn, uh, cherish, and obviously take pride in their cultural heritage. So we do teach um, some language, we do teach uh, literature, we do teach um, uh, some Ukrainian studies, things like history and geography, we do lots of arts and crafts and singing and dancing, um, but uh, 
first and most of all, this is the place where children make friends and create these um, um, social um, bonds uh, with other little Ukrainians. Ukraine today um, is a European nation. And as any European nation, um, it believes in democratic values, respect human rights, civic engagement. Ukrainians today are free, brave, and resilient. And I wanted to share this picture with you. This is a photograph of um, students of our Nottingham Ukrainian school uh, during one of the protests um, um, in Nottingham um, a few weeks ago. So you can see they are all fully dressed and singing Ukrainian anthem uh, from the bottom of their hearts. And on behalf of Ukrainian Nottingham School, uh, just like on behalf of Ukrainian community, not only in Nottingham, but um, um, I take the courage to say on behalf of Ukrainian community in the UK, I want to um, thank um, all uh, British people for their amazing support uh, to all Ukrainians and Ukrainian children specifically, because um, the help and um, all the kind offers we've been receiving, um, they were absolutely overwhelming. So thank you so much for this. Back to um, some numbers. Um, since the 24th of February, this is the date when the lives of many Ukrainians um, changed completely. Um, we have seen um, 4.6 million people fleeing Ukraine. And um, as of the um, recent data um, in the United Kingdom, um, we have seen the total number of just over 27,000 um, people um, that have arrived to the UK. Um, looking at these numbers, we can see that there's a differentiation between various um, visa schemes. Uh, so for those of you who uh, may not be uh, fully aware of that, uh, the government has introduced uh, these two or rather three schemes by now. Um, the first one is being a family scheme, um, which is a um, um, special way uh, for Ukrainians to receive a um, visa if they have uh, a relative or family living in the UK. So uh, they can apply for the visa and then come and live together with the family. The sponsorship scheme is um, for the Ukrainians who do not have any relatives in the UK. And this is where um, any um, family, any British family, any other family living in the UK can act as a sponsor um, and offer uh, their house um, to welcome Ukrainian family, Ukrainian guests. Um, so um, this is what the sponsorship scheme is about. There's another one, uh, there's another way uh, for Ukrainians to um, get this uh, three-year visa at the moment. Uh, this is uh, the extension uh, scheme. Um, I think it was just about to be introduced um, uh, recently. Um, so this is for those who are already in the UK on a different um, visa and they can um, extend uh, so that they can stay longer. So the numbers are quite suggestive and um, this um, picture is another photograph um, from our um, Ukrainian school. This was the first day when we've received um, first um, children from Ukraine, first couple of arrivals. You can, you can see them holding uh, their huge welcome packs. All right. <clears throat> So I know many of you today um, uh, came because uh, you would like to know a little bit more about the education system in Ukraine. So without any further ado, I will um, take you through this slide. Um, so um, the system in, in, in Ukraine generally is not so much different from um, the UK system. Um, we do have um, three main stages uh, within the secondary education. Uh, which is primary school and then basic secondary and then we call it upper secondary, uh, which is uh, pretty much sixth form in the UK or uh, vocational education. Um, I have to say here that um, 
uh, Ukraine is now, uh, the educational system in Ukraine is actually in um, the period of transition. In 2017, 2018, uh, there was a major massive educational reform uh, called New Ukrainian School. Now, as this reform only um, started in 2018, so you can count and do, do your math and uh, you understand that uh, Ukraine currently is in the fourth year of this reform. Um, so some of the um, primary school classes years have already been through um, uh, certain changes, um, but uh, those students who were in uh, higher classes, higher years, uh, they still witness and they still go with the old system. So it's all a bit confusing. Um, however, uh, what uh, are the most important um, changes of this reform and the most important things that it's introduced? Um, from 2018, um, the educational system focuses on um, competencies, so it is competency-based education. Um, schools and teachers have received more autonomy and flexibility. Uh, so there is national curriculum, of course, but it is uh, up to a certain school or teachers to um, uh, introduce and implement certain changes to that. Um, primary schools now have no grading system. There is no assessment as such. Um, however, uh, and I'll get back, get, get back to that um, <clears throat> in a second, um, there are certain standards and the assessment looks pretty much like in uh, the British school in uh, the primary level. Um, so before the reform, um, students used to uh, go to school for um, 11 years. Now, after the reform, um, a 12 year system is introduced. This is why um, here at the table, on the table, uh, you can see 11 and then 12 in brackets. So that means for students who um, didn't witness or were at school already, you know, before the reform, uh, they will finish school studying by the old system. But all the new students um, who um, were at school at the time that the reform started, they will finish it in a 12, 12 year uh, basis. So um, primary school is year one to year four. Uh, basic secondary is year five to year nine, and then the sixth form is obviously two or uh, three years by now. Um, each of these stages uh, is uh, further divided into two phases. Uh, so the first two years, for example, of the primary school is more um, adaptation period. Um, so there are lower expectations and more attention is paid uh, to make sure uh, that uh, children settle in properly to a new school setting. Whereas year three and year four are more uh, uh, focusing on uh, some skill developments and, uh, and uh, a little bit of academic progress. Um, similar uh, similar uh, thing happens in uh, basic sec secondary school. And then uh, by the new reform, uh, the upper secondary or sixth form, so to say, um, um, is planned to be more, uh, so to say, profile education. So this, this, these are uh, pretty much the A-levels, right? So this is the, the, the time um, where students can choose uh, which subjects they would like to major in in, in the future. Um, so primary base and basic secondary school in Ukraine, this is the compulsory education. Uh, and then um, the um, last couple of years, uh, they are optional, but the majority of students in Ukraine decide to go further and they stay for uh, those last years. Now, more interestingly, that uh, usually uh, Ukrainian schools as a building, uh, this is the same building that has primary school, basic secondary, and then upper secondary school. So it's not like in the UK where you, you, you would go to three different buildings, but this is all in one. Um, at the end of each stage, there is a national exam. Um, at the end of year four, um, the exams, the, the students sit um, um, Ukrainian test and math. Um, if this is a school where a minority language is taught, uh, then there might be a separate test for that minority language. So this is where uh, this, this is why I have this little plus in, in, in brackets, just, just to mean that there, there can be something else uh, added. 
Uh, by the end of year nine, uh, there's, there's Ukrainian language, mathematics, and then one elective subject, which is also compulsory. And then students can choose either from biology or chemistry or physics or, or something else. <clears throat> and then by the end of um, uh, year 11 or year 12, there's uh, Ukrainian math, um, history or foreign language, uh, and then an elective subject. Right. Now, a few more words about primary school. <clears throat> Uh, just to give you a um, little bit of a um, um, feeling about what, what, what it is um, to go to um, a school in Ukraine. Uh, in year one, uh, children do have um, four to five lessons a day, uh, each um, lasting about 30 minutes. So um, it is probably uh, more academic <laughs> uh, and more um, uh, strict in a way. Um, it's, it's organized than, than in the UK. Um, but uh, to be honest, this is a lot more um, relaxed and uh, flexible than it used to be under the uh, previous old educational system. So the old system would envisage uh, a very um, sharp and uh, drastic change transition from the nursery education to school, uh, which would um, be sometimes for some students was, was, was quite traumatic. Um, um, yeah, um, so in, in year one, this, this is uh, four to five lessons, and then year two uh, to, to, to year four, um, uh, they turn more into 45 minutes lessons and they're about five lessons a day. Um, another thing, another uh, advantage of this new educational reform is that now in year one and year two, there is no homework. Uh, so once again, this is no news for, for um, uh, British schools. Uh, reading, of course, is, is something that is uh, very strongly encouraged at all levels, but in terms of homework, there is no uh, compulsory um, homework in other subjects. Um, subjects that are taught in primary school are Ukrainian language, math, um, PE, English, um, English as a foreign language is introduced from year one, um, arts, and there's also a subject called uh, literally I explore the world, but basically this is a kind of um, introduction to um, uh, science, I would say, or nature studies. So um, a little bit of um, everything about the world outside. Um, I've mentioned uh, the foreign language being um, introduced from year one. Um, and then from year five, uh, it is recommended uh, to schools to um, look at introducing second foreign language. Um, now, this is um, optional, and obviously this depends also on the school, um, whether uh, it has enough facilities, whether it has enough um, staff to teach that, whether the school is a city school or a rural school. So many uh, different factors come into play, but um, there are quite a lot of schools that um, would choose a second foreign language from year five. Um, now, once again, another um, slight change. Um, um, previously under the old system, uh, because children would start school slightly later, uh, then they were normally, they used to be normally expected to be able to read by the time they start year one. Now, because um, uh, children um, start school at uh, the age of six, um, not seven, um, then it is optional. Still, many children and many parents, obviously it's, it's all up to parents, um, and uh, nursery uh, provision as well. Um, many children can read by the time they start year one, but uh, by no means this is um, an, any, an, any expectation. Um, having said that, um, I've mentioned there is no uh, grades or uh, assessment uh, in um, uh, primary school, uh, but as this educational reform is still fairly new, uh, it will take a little bit of time uh, first of all, for the teachers to get used to the way how it has to be done uh, differently. Many old school teachers still prefer lecturing rather than interacting and introducing some um, um, alternative formats of, 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 of teaching. So uh, it, this, this, this will take a few, a few more years. Um, speaking of children themselves, um, I have to say, once again, um, this is very new and um, 
um, children are not quite used yet to things like self-assessment or peer review, things that are normally, um, uh, I think, quite common in um, uh, UK um, education and schools. So this is just something that you might want to, to pick up and uh, be aware of, uh, um, sort of when it, when it comes to any um, tasks regarding um, assessment. And just a fun fact, um, um, in Ukrainian schools, starting from year one, uh, you would get uh, textbooks for every single subject. So normally the average weight of a school rucksack will be 4.5 kilograms, poor kids. Um, uh, once again, um, this, this, this may be a fun fact, but uh, at the same time, this may be something that uh, you might want to uh, be aware of. Um, uh, as uh, many parents may be, for example, expecting the child to be coming home with a textbook. And uh, I'll get back to that later again. Right. So um, this is how a certificate of achievements, which is an equivalent of a school report, looks in primary school um, in Ukraine these days um, under the um, educational reform. Um, so once uh, again, uh, it looks very similar to what you would uh, see in an um, um, English primary school. Um, the subjects um, or the main items assessed here are things like personal achievements, then Ukrainian language, math, technology, arts, PE, foreign language, um, and then um, the way these subjects are assessed so um, this, this would be these um, uh, vertical um, columns. So um, you would choose whether the child exceeds standards, whether there is any good progress, uh, whether they achieve um, results with a little help of teacher, from the teacher, or whether they need more support and attention. So no big difference, I would say. And um, just to show you in terms of um, literacy, um, this is um, obviously in Ukrainian. Uh, so you can uh, just, just, just pretend um, you, you can understand something, but it's, um, this is an example of a national exam at the end of uh, year four in Ukrainian language. So just wanted to um, show you um, a little um, shot of these um, pages so that you, um, understand the um, volume of the text expected for the students to read and to process. So this would be the text for reading comprehension and the tasks for this text um, would be um, something along the lines, um, working on the punctuation. Um, so answering certain questions and filling in the table, uh, deciding uh, which one is the title, uh, which uh, characters are main, which characters are secondary. Um, uh, answering questions um, uh, and finding um, some specific information in the text, uh, sequence of events, uh, making questions to a certain statement, obviously some um, grammar questions, and the last one usually is more um, a little bit of a creative writing, so you would need to express uh, your opinion on a certain uh, point related to the text, and this would um, ask you to write three to four sentences. Right, um, we'll move to uh, the language situation in Ukraine, and um, this is another very important and very um, sensitive issue um, these days. So um, I gave this slide the title Ukrainians understand Ukrainian um, because we see um, a lot of um, information available recently in Ukrainian and Russian and uh, I personally hear a lot of questions on a daily basis uh, from many people asking you know which 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 language is better, which language is more comfortable uh, for students. And basically with this slide, what I wanted to, to show you, um, uh, here is the chart of um, the schools in Ukraine where the Russian language of instruction. So I think this, this, this curve is pretty much self-explanatory. You can see that um, 
after the 2014. So these these are the uh, the, the year of the uh, events and of the so 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 called Orange Revolution. Uh, we see a massive uh, drop in numbers and. Um, uh, up till now, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's even less than 125 um, schools in Ukraine. Um, so this, this would be the schools where the main language of instruction is Russian. Um, all the other schools, <coughs> all the other schools um, um, are taught in Ukrainian uh, predominantly. Um, doesn't matter if, if the school is in the western part of Ukraine or eastern part of Ukraine. Historically, um, eastern part of Ukraine is more Russian speaking. Um, however, uh, even though this is a more comfortable language on an everyday um, basis, um, it is very important to, to understand that still the main language of the country, the only official language of the country is Ukrainian. So um, every person living in Ukraine would understand Ukrainian. They may choose to speak Russian if they feel more comfortable, but there's absolutely no problem for them in listening comprehension or reading comprehension if, if there is um, anything in, in front of them. Uh, even more, um, it is important uh, also to, to remember that, uh, just, as, as, just as I said, uh, uh, subjects at schools are taught in Ukrainian. So even though that particular child can be speaking more, um, more, um, more in Russian um, in um, their everyday life, but, um, um, the terminology is Ukrainian and trying, but trying to introduce any um, Russian terminology uh, for the subjects uh, that they need at school uh, can be actually counterproductive uh, because this is not what they're used to um, be reading or, or, or using at, at, at school. <clears throat> now, uh, another glimpse at Ukrainian um, language. So as you probably uh, know, uh, Ukrainian language is um, a Slavic language, and uh, this is one of the languages where we use Cyrillic alphabet. So um, many letters look very much like letters in English. Some letters uh, look slightly different. Uh, some letters look the same, but are pronounced differently. Uh, for example, this one here, if you can see my, uh, my marker. Um, this is the letter N, N for Nottingham. It's not the H. Um, so um, these this, this, this letters can be confusing um, for somebody who um, starts learning Ukrainian or, or English, uh, vice versa. <clears throat> Having said that, Ukrainian is very easy to read. Unlike English, uh, the way you read it, the way you write it, and, and, and vice versa. So there is um, no um, difficult um, pronunciation or spelling rules, um, uh, and uh, it is very, very straightforward. Um, so for Ukrainian children, for example, learning English, I think the main difficulty may be with phonics, because this is where the confusion starts and trying to understand uh, how the same sound can be pronounced differently. But um, uh, on the other hand, uh, as, 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 as I already mentioned, um, children learn start learning English language from year one, so they would have already some idea about, about the language. Um, this picture here is to show that um, um, Reading in Ukrainian starts syllable by syllable because this is this is how the language works. And once uh, children mustered um, every letter and every sound separately, uh, they learn how to um, blend two letters and two sounds together. And then <clears throat> they practice written, uh, uh, reading um, syllable by syllable. And sometimes the very first text for Ukrainian learners would look like this. You can see this is the text for year one. And uh, you can see some longer words are already split into syllables, which makes them um, easier for, for a child to read. Um, another um, interesting and useful thing might be that uh, children 
learn to write in cursive, so joined up writing from year one. And um, this cursive joined up writing is very traditional, very popular in Ukraine. Uh, normally we do not uh, even fill in any official forms in block letters, <laughs> which I've recently um, um, and, and, and just re realized is, is actually quite a big problem <laughs> because I couldn't um, uh, read or decipher some, some, some of those uh, names and surnames. But well, <clears throat> um, uh, I'm just trying to say that um, uh, they're quite used with uh, cursive and, or calligraphy, and it might be actually not a big problem for them to learn joint up writing if there is a uh, time and need. Now, um, more practical things, probably. Um, parental expectations um, from school. Um, I chose this <laughs> photograph just um, uh, once again as um, a little bit um, um, uh, of a feel for, for you to um, show what uh, children look like uh, on the first day of school. Probably it's not much different from uh, any other school in the world. Um, but uh, just to say that uh, traditionally, uh, Ukrainian school um, would start with a, uh, some sort of celebration, we call it uh, the first bell and the last bell, um, like school bell, um, the first day and the last day, uh, there's a big um, uh, festival, holiday, um, children um, dress up in their best clothing, they all bring flowers to teachers and uh, well, you can see that the youngest ones are a bit bored with this. <clears throat> um, as when, when, when it comes to um, parents and um, their expectations from uh, schools generally, um, I think um, Ukrainian parents uh, are very active and uh, would like to take a um, very active part in everything when it comes to uh, their children's education or academic program uh, progress. So <clears throat> this is where I would like to remember that fact that Ukrainian schools do have textbooks for every subject. And um, you may um, hear or get um, uh, some questions from parents um, about, well, where is the textbook or what would you like you know, me, me to do? Or you know, what, what, what did they learn today at school? Um, and um, parents are used to checking homework or at least supervising homework and uh, making sure that uh, children have done it all uh, properly. So um, I think uh, whenever it comes to um, any support from parents, uh, there shouldn't be any problems generally. Um, uh, on the contrary, I think uh, the parents would be so willing to help and so willing to uh, take part, you might sometimes even want to stop them. Um, for many children, um, um, various extracurricular activities are also uh, increasingly popular. Um, so um, you would uh, see children taking, uh, well, something, one, 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 one sort or another of, of activity pretty much every day of um, uh, the week after school. Um, and uh, this is once again uh, shows that uh, parents uh, really care uh, that their children get um, a lot of training and practice in um, various uh, fields. So this, this would definitely be music or dancing or some sort, some sort of sport and, and arts and, and so on. <clears throat> um, Parents would generally like to know um, any details or any information on their child's progress. Um, which is which is great, um, and um, um, for that uh, there's uh, lots of chat groups, WhatsApp groups, Viber groups uh, back in Ukraine. Uh, you know, there's absolutely no problem of uh, involving them into um, uh, any uh, round school discussions. Uh, I think uh, most of them they would uh, be very happy to take part in that. Um, just on the um, separate note um, um, to, 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 to um, draw your attention, um, the GDPR thing as a concept is still fairly new um, for Ukraine. And um, uh, just so that you make sure 
you know, your families, if you if, if you have somebody at your school, um, they know what the implications are. And uh, for example, if there's any consent forms that you're sending out, uh, you might want to explain what this is because the whole concept can be still quite difficult to, to, to understand for them. And you would you would you, you may want to um, remind them about some of the things you know that are uh, done or are allowed to do or not not allowed to, to, to be done at school. <clears throat> Um, in terms of um, children and um, any cultural differences, uh, I was thinking um, uh, about this, this, this slide for, for quite a while, and actually I do have a few um, stories to tell here. Um, I think generally, parents' expectations are for their children. Um, they would, of course, want them to be perfect. Um, and I was thinking about that, looking into the um, um, past and um, history of um, Ukraine, um, thinking about all the hardships and difficult times that um, the generation of uh, these days parents have been, um, you know, through the Soviet Union and so on. Um, so these this were some difficult times where I feel many people could not achieve their potential in life in terms of professionally or career-wise and so on. And of course, this is a general kind of natural desire uh, to make sure their children get the most uh, in life. Um, so this is where probably, you know, parents are trying to um, do all they can to uh, provide the best education, uh, the best opportunities for their children. Um, they are quite conscious of, um, uh, all the mistakes children make, um, which um, which can be sometimes upsetting, we know. But uh, just uh, so that you know that uh, whenever child gets um, upset about you know making a mistake, um, this is not something um, strange or abnormal. This is probably you know just just a cultural thing, really. Um, in terms of um, Tidiness, once again, um, going to that uh, whole concept of uh, perfection. Um, I remember my first year in the UK uh, when my daughter started going to the nursery and she was three at the time. And one day when I came to collect her from the nursery, um, the teacher told me um, something along the lines, you know, um, well, your daughter doesn't really like to, to get dirty in play or something. And I remember I was, I was standing there and listening uh, to her and thinking to myself, is this supposed to be a compliment or was that a sort of a re reproach? <laughs> and now as I think about it more, I can uh, I understand better what, what she meant by, uh, by that. But um, uh, once again, um, you know, encouraging children to all the sensory play is wonderful. Um, but for many Ukrainian children, this can be um, another understanding or interpretation of, of, of the whole process. And they can understand or interpret this as basically getting dirty, uh, which is not something that, you know, they are encouraged at home because mom told me, you know, to, uh, to get back home um, in a clean uniform, so to say. So once again, this is just something to, to bear in mind. Discipline, once again, going back to this perfection thing. Um, another, another example, uh, just recently we welcomed uh, a little girl from Ukraine in our Ukrainian school. And um, um, when it came to um, uh, talking or answering the question that, that I asked students, every time she would uh, uh, have to say something, she would stand up. And then I remember all my other students, so these are Ukrainians, but uh, born here, or Ukrainians who go to, well, English schools uh, for, for, for many years, they were all really, really surprised to see that, and they couldn't understand why, 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 why is she standing up? But this is just one of the things, um, you know, to, uh, to, to show you, you know, another illustration that this um, whole school setting uh, is still quite formal, and um, the, the discipline uh, in that is also of 
um, certain standard. So this this is where I picked up this um, um, photograph to show you, you know, this perfectly um, dressed um, little boy, you know, sitting nicely and diligently at his desk and um, patiently waiting for the teacher to call on him. So these these are the type of things that you can. Um, may see um, from some of the Ukrainian students if you get some at your um, schools. Um, once again, you know, something just to, to be aware of. <clears throat> now, um, I wanted also to kind of pinpoint a few um, important things, so maybe um, some advice that you may find um, useful. Um, so some do's and don'ts probably um, in dealing with Ukrainian children in your class. Um, so I would definitely recommend, and I know many of you will, will do it, you know, with, without even me telling you, um, meeting the family and uh, liaising regularly. Um, the language barrier can be um, quite um, um, essential, substantial here. Uh, but if, if the uh, oral communication doesn't work, I know from experience, um, uh, working with um, other um, foreign, little foreigners uh, in the UK that sometimes writing notes helps because uh, the basic problem uh, for children and parents alike um, is listening comprehension, you know, whereas, you know, reading comprehension is a lot easier for them. So if you're struggling in uh, explaining something, jot, jot it down, write it down and then hand it over. So like an exchange of, of little notes. Um, I think uh, if you would like to really support um, a Ukrainian student in your class, I'm sure they would really, really appreciate if you um, uh, as a class did some sort of activity together. Um, even if it's, um, I don't know, learning a few Ukrainian words or maybe just talking about um, a Ukraine as a country, um, maybe displaying a little greeting in Ukrainian, just like I, I know schools like to do, you know, ha have all these different hellos in different languages. So just make sure, you know, you have a little something in, in, in class and that will already be a warm welcome for them. Um, uh, going back to the language uh, sensitive issue, um, I know um, probably the um, chances of finding a Russian speaker um, are a lot higher than uh, finding a Ukrainian speaker. But here I would just like to warn you um, that uh, you do consult with parents before you um, uh, make that decision. Uh, because for many Ukrainians, even though they are Russian speakers uh, in everyday life, uh, it is now a very um, sensitive thing and uh, it is their conscious decision to try and step away from that and um, actually um, be separated. So um, in a way, uh, I would say uh, consult with the parents and possibly it would actually be easier to finding a Ukrainian speaker um, uh, than the Russian speaker there. Um, another, uh, another piece of advice um, uh, also from, from experience and uh, going back to um, parents' expectations. Um, as I said, um, we do get uh, textbooks for every subject. So um, for parents willing to help their children at home, um, this is a very common thing to go back to the textbook and look through the material that the child has learned at school today. Now, because children in primary schools and secondary schools, um, um, some, some subjects, some classes, do not seem to have anything of a textbook format, it is difficult for parents to follow up on, on, on the material. Um, so even uh, in terms of the language support, I think if you uh, can spare a few minutes uh, of your time and uh, get another copy or some sort of handout, um, something that would reflect the key words or maybe key phrases or key concepts of uh, anything you do in class and then share it with the parents so that they can follow it up at home, this would be greatly appreciated. Um, I would not um, um, 
expect any um, friendships between Ukrainian and Russian children on the basis of the shared language, uh, just once again for, for that sensitive um, um, thing. And um, also, um, once again, I have seen it um, already among a few uh, Ukrainian children in our school that um, they are still struggling sometimes with any fun or exciting activities because they feel uh, these things are still quite under the circumstances. So if some, if 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 you if you if you feel if you see a child is a bit reluctant, uh, I would uh, recommend just 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 being patient and uh, be supportive as much as you can. Right. Um, for community involvement, um, I have this long list of um, um, links and resources uh, that I'm sure um, Silvana will be happy to share with you. Later on, in fact, I have a lot more of them, but uh, I, I, I thought the slides were too short <laughs> for that, uh, so apologies. Um, if you wanted to find a local Ukrainian community or Ukrainian school, the AUGB website will be the best place to go. Um, obviously, um, uh, try and contact um, anyone from your local Ukrainian community to see if anyone can come and help as a volunteer. Uh, if you get um, too many students at school, possibly you may want to um, employ Ukrainian teaching assistant, who knows. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, useful resources and websites, uh, Ukrainian Facebook, uh, lots of uh, bilingual books and, and other um, resources. Um, and um, just, just so that you know that um, uh, Ukraine um, has not left these, these kids um, on their own. Um, the educational uh, system is uh, all online, um, so all children get access to distance learning and they can still carry on learning um, some Ukrainian and go back to, and, and check on their subjects if they, if they want to. So <clears throat> these are some of the resources uh, uh, that, you, that you may find useful. And uh, I think I think that will probably be. <laughs> Thank exactly. you so much. This has been such um, such an inform, you know, in, information rich, insightful um, talk. Thank you so much. We already have a lot of positive feedback in the chat, and we've got thousands of questions for you. So I'll try and filter them um, thematically. So I've been able to sh to kind of link a few together. So my first question is around. Um, Amanda asks uh, whether new students want to talk about the situation back home. Do we ask? And she's saying that members of staff in her school felt a bit clinical just talking about so you know school life. Um, so is it about welcoming them, acknowledging their situation, and how strange it must be and hard being a new country and leaving everything behind? Any guidance that you can give us would be great, she says, as we don't want to upset our new students, but on the same token, we don't want them to feel we don't care. Right, that is a really, really good question. Thank you for that. I would say, um, um, no, that does, doesn't sound very original, but um, uh, every child is different. So, and, and as I said, yeah, I've, I've seen it myself. Uh, there are some children who would prefer to uh, be quiet and not really um, talk a lot the first couple of days, uh, but then they open up a bit later, later on. And then you get children who on the first day uh, when they come to class and they introduce themselves, I had a girl who said, uh, hi, hello, my name is Maria, I'm from Kiev, and uh, uh, the street next to my house was bombed. Uh, and, you know, this is this is kind of, you know, the whole thing that she puts in one sentence and, you know, it blows you away because it's just too information for you. <laughs> but uh, just, just, you know, so, so that you are prepared. There are children who are ready to talk about it and there may be children who are not quite ready to talk about it mm -hmm. so rather than you know maybe asking them uh, or any any specific question i would probably um say wait and see you know when when when, when they are ready to talk and then just just support them thank you um, a similar but different question would parents have any idea about safeguarding and things that schools might raise as a safeguarding concern nina I think it's always better if you um, go through all those safeguarding issues and explain those procedures to them, because even though um, uh, there's a um, kind of higher awareness, I would say, in Ukraine these days, it may still vary from school to school. And uh, just just to be on the safe side, you know, this is not something, you know, I would uh, yeah take for granted. 
Thank you. A uh, couple of questions around early years and preschool, etc. So Louise and Rebecca want to know what the early years look like in Ukraine from uh, zero to five years old. Um, yeah, the, the early years uh, would probably look um, um, a lot more similar to, to, to the UK style. Um, so there's lots of play um, um, and support. And I think the, the, the last year before school, they already started looking into some letters. So this is for possibly, you know, the, the time when, you know, they, they start trying, you know, picking up, you know, a few, few things and at least, you know, be able to write their name. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a similar question. Do children generally attend preschool or nursery before the age of six? Um, you would get a nursery and then a preschool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell us how, how old or how long? Um, <clears throat> I want to put you on the spot. We can move on if you want, Lena. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, be I better check that out. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, we can actually, when, when we send the link to the webinar recording, we will also send links to any sites and the links that Lena mentioned so we can add that, um, you know, information about that. Um, who teaches them how to read before they start school in year one? And do they also learn how to write? Um, obviously, this, this, this can um, start in um, preschool, in their early, early education, but uh, it is also very much up to parents themselves. Uh, but as I said, you know, uh, these days it is uh, not compulsory. This is not expected of children. Uh, so when they start year one, uh, you would definitely start from the very beginning and you would cover all the areas that, you know, you're, you're not uh, familiar with. Okay, thank you. Sharon says um, she, she had um, Ukrainian student recently joining her school, very able. He should be in year 11, but has been placed in year 10 to give him more time to adjust to the British school system. His father asked if there would be an opportunity to take Ukraine as a GCSE next summer, and she checked the exam boards, but found there is no such exam. So she wants to know if you envisage exam boards being able to offer this in the future? That is another very good question. Um, Ukrainian language has the um, status of um, an elective foreign language for GCSE until 1995. Unfortunately, we've lost that status 1995 uh, because there were not enough students on a regular basis annually uh, to be applying uh, for, for that exam. Um, so um, I think for... Um, this coming year, probably this is not likely to happen, but uh, possibly if um, the numbers are very high and the demand is high, possibly there, there, there can be some changes in the near future. But I think this is the Board of Education that, that needs to be addressed with this. Thank you. A question about if it's possible for children to fail a year, and if so, do they repeat? Yes. This is how it works in Ukraine. <laughs> okay, good, short answer. Another question now. <laughs> Katie and Claire asking about foreign languages. So could you give us some idea of how English is taught in Ukraine? For example, when it is introduced, are the students taught pho phonic sounds? How do they make the transition from Cyrillic script? How much English would the average 10 year old have? Fantastic, I have a perfect answer to that. <laughs> I knew this question was coming. Um, so, um, as I said, um, um, English is introduced from year one. Of course, they do uh, go through phonics and, and all of that. Um, the main issue, I would say, uh, uh, just as I mentioned previously, uh, might be actually listening comprehension, and it will take time for anyone, child or adult, to get used to uh, British pronunciation or accent. Um, but uh, to give you an idea about um, the level of uh, English uh, for an average 10 year old. Well, what a coincidence. Um, Sorry, I stopped share. Sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah, You'll have um, to share again. I'll, I'll, so. Yeah, I'll, I will just go uh, back. And I have, um, I have a um, video um, of a, um, Oops, I can't share. How about now? All right, yeah, okay, perfect. <clears throat> I have a video um, of a um, uh, 
final presentation um, uh, prepared by a girl in year four. This is Ukrainian year four, so she's 10. So that would be probably year five, six in, uh, in, in the UK, uh, just to give you an idea. So she's written all, it, uh, all, all of this text by herself, and uh, she's going to read it out to you. Hello, now I will tell you what style I prefer and what clothes I like. I'm absolutely sure that clothes should be comfortable. The way I dress depends on my mood, season and situation. I like free style of clothing, for example, jeans, t-shirts, hoodies, tops, vests and caps. Jeans can be wrong with sneakers. In this I can go for a walk and meet my friends. On a holiday I wear festive clothes, for example, a dress and sandals. So for me uh, the way I look is important, but of course I don't think that clothes are the most important thing uh, in our life. Uh, so I follow fashion, but I don't spend half of my free time shopping. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That's so useful, Lena. Amazing. Um, I'm afraid it's already five o'clock. I would have you answering questions forever, but we'll have to stop, I'm afraid. So before we uh, finish, thank you again for such a fantastic, informative, wonderful talk. Um, uh, thank you. So what I'm going to do now is to give a little bit of information about um, our forthcoming webinars and courses. So on Wednesday, the 25th of May at four o'clock and on Thursday, the 26th of May at four o'clock, we've got two webinars on supporting new refugee arrivals. So the 25th is about primary and the 26th is about secondary. And here we are going to be talking about the importance of collating and sharing the information about new arrivals the case for mainstream education about how to you know how to so socially include the children the role of buddies including those who speak the same languages also academic inclusion supporting the learners in the learning process and parental engagement we also have a three hour online course beginning in september over four weeks so three hours over four weeks so that people have time to learn deeply and it's about supporting new arrivals who are new to English. This is a very highly practical and evidence informed course and it will explore what support needs to be in place for learners who use English as an additional language before admission, before the pupil starts, in the first few days and during initial weeks. In addition to that, please check the Bell Foundation's website. We have a dedicated web page on guidance and resources uh, for welcoming refugee and asylum seeking learners um, with written guidance translated in different languages, um, including Ukrainian. Um, on diversity of learners, integration and support. Uh, we also have a, a back catalogue, if you like, of recorded webinars. Remember, this is the third in a series, so we have done already another two webinars on welcoming refugee children, and there are more to come. Um, there are articles and blogs, um, there are um, the C assessment framework, teaching strategies and teaching resources. So please check the Bell Foundation website. We also have produced guidance and resources on parental involvement. So we have a, a guidance called Helping Children Learn for Parents and about the English education system, which again is, trans is translated into different languages so that um, you know, we can share it with parents for whom English is a new language. So that's it from us all at the Bell Foundation. I wanted to thank you again, Lena, for such a brilliant, brilliant session. And uh, to remind everyone that you will get, um, uh, when you leave the webinar, a post-course evaluation form will appear and that you will get a link to the same form in the email that you will receive in the next 48 hours. We would be very grateful if you could spend a few moments to complete it as your views will help us shape our future webinar program. Thank you very much to all of you for taking part in today's webinar. And thank you again, Lina. Tremendously inspiring and, and informative. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you from the Bell Foundation and goodbye.